three-dimensional games were clearly the future, but traditional computer architecture was not designed to fit. Early accelerator cards like 3DFX's Voodoo unlocked CPU rendering limits and saw a bloom in the potential of 3D gaming. Faster frame rates, higher resolutions, better graphics than ever before. Like so many visual firsts, the earliest hardware assistance for 3D games can be found in the arcades. 2D tricks were old hat by the late 80s, and so the 3D tech provided by Namco System 21 Polygonizer was a no-brainer. It powered games like Winning Run, and was the first arcade board specifically designed to accelerate polygonal 3D graphics. Others followed suit, and in the arms race at the arcades, Hardware 3D graphics would become the de facto attract mode. Similar hardware assistance found its way into the home consoles too. The Super NES's Super FX chipset was a latecomer to the 4th gen and provided faster polygon rendering. By the 5th generation, a graphical coprocessor was a must. Polygons were hot and the hardware had to match. Once 3D cards reached the PC market, they quickly became a must-have accessory for gaming, and the modular nature of PCs has helped them to establish unchallenged graphical dominance since. Games like Doom and Quake pushed sales of powerful 486 and Pentium-class CPUs, and when paired with a dedicated GPU, not much could touch the PC's power. It was first-person shooters that garnered the most attention for their graphics, with games like GL Quake getting early support for 3D acceleration. By 1998, the first wave of shooters designed to take advantage of such hardware started to roll out. And the first Unreal was certainly a head-turner in its day. With a silky smooth frame rate, coloured lighting, detailed textures and level geometry, Unreal and its engine would quickly become associated with cutting-edge graphics. Its technology would go on to power many other games, more than just an impressive looking demo, Unreal would prove to be a powerful and portable platform. Its software's tech behind Quake would see similar reuse, powering games like Half-Life amongst many others. By the end of the millennium, the popularity of 3D accelerator cards was such that Quake 3 Arena abandoned its support for software rendering entirely. Any PC gamer without a 3D card at this point was left playing solitaire. FPS was the dominant genre during this explosion of 3D acceleration, and this wouldn't change much in the future. The early 2000s brought with it a wave of follow-up titles to the emergent franchises from the previous decade, and in each instance they brought an expectation of superior visuals. Sequels are also expected to raise the bar in terms of gameplay, and so some had quite a reputation to live up to. Half-Life 2 was praised for its overarching style, combining state-of-the-art graphics with a bleak aesthetic, and impressive if over-eager demonstration of its physics capabilities. Similarly, id Software had quite a task ahead when they stepped up to produce a sequel to the legendary Doom. Doom 3 saw a radical departure from the brighter graphics of the original, with the game fully embracing very dark environments. The dim lighting did help ratchet up the atmosphere, however, and your reliance on a flashlight to carve out a narrow cone of vision made for some tense moments during monstrous encounters. It was a departure from the original both in style and substance, a tech-focused game which embraced new generation features, unified lighting and shadowing, and a detailed world with more complex animations. However, amidst all this new technology, some techniques turned stale. It seems that the popularity of World War II shooters during this time left a lasting impression. The gritty brown hues these games use became quite the trend for a while, with developers desaturating colours as part of an effort towards realism. The origin of the style can be traced to Quake, with its subdued tones imparting a gothic industrial charm, but an aversion to bright colours would later permeate games across all genres. The minimalistic approach of Shadow of the Colossus was reflected in its palette choice, with subdued tones complementing the game's restrained style. Other uses are less fitting, 
the dull yellow tones of Need for Speed Most Wanted are consistent throughout, giving the game a certain unified look, but crushing the colour gamma in the process. Although the excessive use of brown has abated slightly in recent years, it does still crop up. Duller tones are a good fit for post-apocalyptic settings, after all. Brown was but one trademark of this era, and it was a common counterpart to another blinding effect in Bloom. Bright objects bleed into their surroundings as though viewed through a cinematic lens smeared with Vaseline. The effect intended to make bright objects appear brighter. One of the first games to make use of this style was Eco, with its soft lighting reinforcing a naturalistic style. The technique became more popular in the wake of Monolith's Tron 2.0, the neon light glow a fitting addition to emulate the original film's visuals. The techniques they used were detailed in an article, and since then the effect has found its way into many other titles. Overdone Bloom is a common criticism levied at games of this era. It can be a convincing effect when subtle, but when presented with a novel tool, developers are not always known for their restraint. More recently, the effect has been toned down, and can help an otherwise flat-looking scene by simulating the higher dynamic range of natural light, or by adding a touch of cyberpunk-inspired neon flare. While dull tones and cinematic effects are both intended to inject realism into games, some took a more stylized approach instead. Cell shading is the deliberate use of flat color and inked outlines to give 3D images a cartoon-like appearance. Early titles like Jet Set Radio embraced the style and catapulted it into prominence. And it served as a pleasant reminder that not every game has to drudgingly adhere to reality. The style can be divisive, however. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker's visuals are striking, but the game's sales are overshadowed by the much more successful Ocarina of Time, a fact sometimes attributed to the cartoon style. It marks a deliberate shift in focus towards a more cohesive aesthetic instead of photorealism. This was a departure from a time when every new game was expected to make a major leap forward in visuals, an important realisation as video game budgets spiral ever upwards. The middle of the millennial decade ushered in the start of the seventh console generation, and marks our arrival in a contemporary era. 3D technology was mature, and hardware more powerful than ever. So, where do we go from here? Join me in the final part of the series for the past, present, and future of video game graphics. Until then, farewell.